Hi, everyone. Welcome to Demo Day. I am so excited to welcome all of you here. And I am honestly so proud of all the work that you have done. And you should all, sp all be so proud of yourselves as well. I tell this story all the time, but I tried to do the intro to Python course and I gave up because it's just really, really difficult. So you should all be so excited about your really, really great career change into the world of tech. So health and safety, if there is a fire, please get out. If you're at home and there is a fire, please also get out. We have toilets around the corner. There's water stations around as well. I should have introduced myself. You all probably, <laughs> you all probably have met me before or seen me on a careers workshop, but my name is Sandy. I am the careers lead here at Makers and I will be supporting you all on your job hunt journey. So I expect all of your CVs on Monday. Another bit of housekeeping, if you are on site, please do talk into either microphone so that everyone at home can hear. If you have a question to ask from the audience, please also use one of the microphones to ask a question. Claire, have I forgotten anything? Um, no, sounds good. I can introduce the course really briefly and just uh, introduce the projects for today, if that's okay. Perfect. Cool. So good evening. Uh, my name is Claire and I am a technical coach here at Makers and I have been supporting the um, software engineers that you're going to see today. And we are here to showcase their incredible work that they've done for their final projects. So each of the four teams that you will see today will present what they've been working on over the past two weeks. Uh, but they have completed the Makers Academy Bootcamp, which is a 16 weeks um, intense coding bootcamp. And over the course of their time here, um, our developers go from working on the basics of programming to being able to build full stack applications from scratch, which is quite incredible. So it's really a credit to them to see what they can now um, build after the course. Um, so they've been building projects that they'd like to see and use in real life, and they've also been deploying them. So it's been a privilege and a pleasure as well to support them throughout their journey. Um, so in terms of the projects that you're going to see today, all the ideas, the research and the execution has been entirely crafted from scratch by each team. Um, so unlike the other engineering projects that we've done throughout the course, where we gave them some code and some prompts and some ideas, they have completely came, come up with everything themselves. Um, they have picked up some new um, tech stacks and some frameworks in order to bring their ideas to reality in many cases. And they've had to utilize all of the skills that they've learned during the bootcamp. So anything ranging from agile teamwork to planning, research, implementation, it's all them. Um, so yeah, without much uh, further ado, I'd like to introduce the teams. Um, and we will be starting this evening with team, let me check, team Booksy. If you guys want to um, get going, the floor is yours. <laughs> So working? Okay, cool. Um, hello, everyone. So we are Team Booksy, and I am just going to do a quick intro to what our project is and what application uh, we have built. If I can find the page. Okay, cool. Just... Sweet. Um, so yeah, I am Joshua and we are Team Booksy. And basically what we, uh, the application that we built is a book listing and purchasing site. Um, so users are able to browse their favorite books and buy their favorite books. Um, so just here on the screen, you can see our planning process. We spent quite a lot of time planning because we just wanted to have a very clear vision um, of what we wanted to build. Um, we needed to really think about how we wanted to handle things such as user authentication, um, which APIs would be integrated into our project, and just the overall user experience. Um, so in terms of our tech stack, we decided to use a MERN stack, which is um, a MongoDB database, Express backend, and then for the front end, we used React and um, Node. And yeah, so for the database, we actually had a cloud um, database, so we were all working with the same uh, stored information throughout the whole project. 
um, we seeded all of our book data from a Google Books API. Um, and in terms of user authentication, we had an external authentication process, uh, which was all handled by Clerk. And we had to think about how we were going to handle user payments. Um, and that's all handled by Stripe. We actually deployed both of our front end and back end. So it is a live website and I'm actually the, can I share that in the chat? Can I access the chat? Yeah. Okay. By the end of this demo, I will share the link in the chat <laughs> and you guys will be able to actually go on our website and possibly buy a book. Um, <laughs> But yeah, without going into uh, too much detail, um, our main focus in this project was to explore different methods that we hadn't used before in different projects. Um, and overall, it was quite challenging, but I'd say it was a very positive learning experience. And yeah, I am going to pass it over to Ilhan, who is going to talk more about the user authentication. Thank you. Um, I'll have the video sort of playing on in the background, but I think the thing that we were that was really important to us was having a smooth user experience. Everyone expects to be able to log in with Google, with Apple, and that's how that sort of works these days. And we wanted to have like secure authentication. So we ended up going with a third party provider called Clerk. Um, it's essentially worked really well with our tech. So that's why we chose that. Um, and it's just really handy. It adds uh, another layer of authentication. You have to pop in a code from your email to make that work. And that's all stored securely. So we don't deal with passwords at all. So if we were breached at any point, we don't have a single password to give up, which is really nice. Um, and yeah, it was really difficult. I think I would say it was more difficult to set up than I thought it would be. Um, what I'll share now is uh, the other bit that I thought was really cool about it was that one of the reasons that we deployed our backend was that Clerk needed a live backend to send webhooks to, which is essentially to send information on the web, right? Um, so that was one of the reasons we had to do that. And yeah, it just gave, gave us a really nice user dashboard. So we know when people log in, we have all that data and we can report on that, which is really cool. Yeah, I'll pass on to Demetrius. Yeah, I will talk a bit about about our page. So this is our home page. You can see you can see the books by categories. You can see the selection of our favorite books. And if you click on a book, you can see the book's details. You can see a detailed description. You can add it to your favorites or remove it from your favorites. And if you add it, you can see it in the favorites book page. And if you click on any book from there, it will take you back to the books page. Um, also, we have uh, created a settings page because you realize the address of the user is very important because that's how you deliver the books. So if someone buys a book, <laughs> we need their address to send the, the books. So yeah, I'm just showing how to edit uh, an existing address in case the address was saved successfully. Also, we have some email preferences settings for the user. So he doesn't get bothered by our uh, commercial emails if he doesn't want to. <laughs> okay, and uh, that's about it, about the books, page, and favorites. I will pass this on to Yoshio again. I am back. Hello. Um, yeah, so Demetrius was talking about the website, and I'm going to talk about how a user can actually browse for books um, using Booksy. So whether you log in as a guest, I mean, with an account or whether you're browsing with a guest, this is the landing page that you'll see. Um, as you can see at the top, we have a list of our bestsellers. You have the option to browse by category, or you can see a selection of our favorite books. Um, there's a lot of books that we've seeded from Google's API, but if you wanted to browse our bestsellers, you can use the little Chevron on the side and you can just cycle through a list of our best-selling books. Um, again, you have the option to shop by category. So we have 10 different categories. Um, say you wanted to look at nonfiction books, we have a bunch of books here. Um, and you can also sort by either alphabet uh, alphabetically. 
or price from low to high or from high to low. Um, so those were little features that we thought were very important to have um, on our website. We also have on the side a categories list, so you can select different categories uh, for different books that you'd like to purchase. And you can also select multiple categories at once. And as you can see, the book, um, the books are updated based on those categories. If you have a specific book that you'd like to search for, you can just type in the title and then you're taken to the individual book page where you can add it to your basket or to your favorites. You can also search by author. So if you have a favorite author, um, you can click on the author name and it will list a bunch of books by that author. And there is also the opportunity to search by ISBN number. So if you know the ISBN, you can just pop that into the search bar and click on the book. So e-commerce for dummies, a book that we definitely read to help us build this website. And yeah, you can leave a review, add it to your basket, check out very securely um, using Stripe. And also JavaScript for dummies because we forgot how to use uh, JavaScript. <laughs> but yeah, um, that is basically how users can search for books. And I am going to pass it on to Tom. So I'm just going to show the review page here. So as you can see, we've got different reviews that a user might leave. So in this case, we've got a review title, some content, the rating that the user's given, as well as who gave it and when the date was that they gave it. Um, we can sign in if we want to leave a review. So only signed in users can do this, not guests. And I've got a demonstration of what that looks like here. So you see that the user can type in a title, they can add some content, and you also notice that the share button is disabled until all the fields are put in. So you can see currently it's disabled, but once we add a rating, the user can share this and then that updates on the page. And then I'm also going to add to the basket and we can see that if I click on the basket page, that will no show up. And then one final thing I'm going to show is just some mobile CSS that we worked on. So because we deployed it, we thought it was important to show what it might look like for a mobile user. So we can see the menu slightly changes how it looks. And if we go onto a book page as well, you can see that it also adapts so that if you are on mobile, it doesn't look any different than it should on desktop. Um, I'm now going to pass to Fawaz, who's just going to go through the basket and check out. So today I will talk about checkout feature. So as all we know, basket, shopping basket and checkout for payment is like two most important feature for any e-commerce web application. So I was really focused about these two features throughout the project. So for checkout, we use like a third party application Stripe. So that was like, um, we impl implemented Stripe here. So if a user click on checkout, it will redirect to the Stripe posted page. And uh, the thing is why we use a Stripe, two main, again, the security thing, like they are very concerned about security and they highly follow all the compliance and legislation and all the security concepts. And second was about the global global payment thing. So uh, by implementing this thing, we can accept payments all over the globe, even the payout to the, even if we need to refund or we can pay out internationally. So let me, uh, as, as you can see, I've added a couple of books here. So let me try to check out. Okay, so this one is Stripe hosted page, but we have an option to embed this in our web application. So still we can use our host hosting as well on the top. And uh, second, as I've mentioned, like there are several payment options. We can do Google Pay, Apple Pay, like all the international payments processes we can follow with a single click. And in the video, I will demonstrate like once we go to dashboard of Stripe, we have tons of options with just one 
click, we can turn on, turn off, and even for the buy now, pay later option. So that's we can integrate as well. So I'm I'm just gonna fill this form. I'm not using a real card here, so uh, I will just copy a dummy card, which will prove uh, it's being integrated to our web application. I will just copy it from the documents from Stripe. Should have fast track this one, but bear with me now. Okay, so once it's successful, it redirects back to our web, web application. And we can see the payment is successful, receive the order number, and most probably like in two working days, I'll receive this book, maybe. <laughs> and I can see like even in a testing mode, we made 724 pounds. Even we got, <laughs> we got this uh, confirmation like for us, paid like 31 pounds. Oh, yeah, and in the end, I would mention like this project was not just about uh, practicing full fledged like full stack web application. It was more about facing challenges on daily basis, not just daily basis on hourly basis. And the uh, good part was we need to overcome these challenges like daily. So that was like a main I understood. And second, like. Uh, we were staying in continuously in learning mode, learning and development mode on daily basis. So that's my my result from this project is. And in the end, yeah, thank you, Booksy team and Makers team for everything. And Enhan, do you want to do a closing words or something? <laughs> <laughs> we had a really good time. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much guys thank you very much team boxy awesome. again very well done and all your work because this is like quite a lot of things that you've managed to implement and all the attention that you paid to security to usability like both for the user and the person potentially running the platform with all the stats and information that you would get uh, i think is really outstanding so nicely done if you would like to ask some questions to Tim Booksy, if you're in the room, you can ask them directly. But if you are attending the call, you can use the Q&A function in Zoom um, and they will pop in in the uh, chat there. And yeah, I can see that you just put in, put in the chat the um, link to the application. So if you want to give it uh, a try um, on the live deployed version, click the link and see what's there. I'll just give a little bit of time and space to see if we can open some questions in the Q&A. Uh, and if anyone in the room has any questions, please do feel free to take the, the microphone and ask them. Claire, we have a question in the room. Oh, very nice. What would you have done next? How would you have further enhanced it? I think we'd spent some more time improving the UX of the product. <laughs> That's what I'd say. But um, there's probably a couple more features you could implement. Maybe something like doing something similar to Goodreads, being able to follow friends. That would be fun. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Oh, I can see so in the Q&A, um, are the pictures hot linked from another service or are you serving them? Um, yeah, so we're using Google's API to get both the books and then the images also come from Google's API. So we've got a few more questions. So is a confirmation email sent to the customer? Um, not yet. That would definitely be something that would be coming next. Yes. And sorry, Ilhan, there's another one. There's a few, a couple of more questions. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, what challenges did you have during the development? Um, I think working with so many third-party uh, APIs was actually really probably the biggest difficulty. 
um, especially like starting with Clerk. They had really good documentation, but we didn't know that we had to have a live <laughs> server up and running. So we had to do that in the first couple of days. Um, the Stripe API as well um, was a bit finickety, I'd say. So really working with those, but like there was there was really good documentation. So I'd say, um, yeah, that was the most difficult bit. I was just wondering like about Clerk, since I haven't used anything like that before. I think there's quite a few different services. Did you come did you decide on Clerk for a particular reason or Yeah, um they had a lot of documentation, um, essentially specifically for Mernstack, so Next.js, React, um, yeah, and the implementation itself, like they had really good documentation for it. There were other services we looked at, but I just didn't think the documentation was as um, clear enough. Oh, any other questions in the room? Sorry, I can't, I can't quite tell from here. I don't think so. I think we're good. Cool. So in that case, we will move on to the next team, which is uh, Team Bloom. We just have a slight technical issue with Team Bloom. So two people will come up as, um, as Johnny's account because one uh, Zoom link didn't work, but it's two different people. <laughs> so Aisha and Johnny are sharing yeah. the Zoom link. Yeah, Tim Bloom, um, your turn. <laughs> oh, can everyone see the screen on, on, on your side? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. All right. Um, cool. So we are uh, Team Bloom. Uh, I'm Marty. Uh, I'll start by um, sort of briefly talking about the idea behind Bloom and what it is, what we were trying to build. Um, so Bloom is essentially a plant care community. Um, it was conceived of as a space where users can sort of um, ask for help or offer help um, when it comes to plant care. Um, in its current version, users can sign up, uh, make requests for help, uh, make offers to help. And uh, also there's an ability to keep track of sort of the, the plants in your collection. Um, I'll pass it on to uh, Marcella, who will talk a bit about the planning of the project. Yes, thank you. About the organization of our project, we started by having an initial brainstorm to define what we used to do in terms of backend, front end, and each technologies, which person would you like to work. And we defined what you be best for us. And we decided what function our app you to have and you rank it in order of priority, thinking about what you'd be good for MVP, what you could do good to do uh, implement after finishing the MVP and what we can do as a complement in the future. Uh, from this, we building our initial database schema and it list our tables and how they would be related related to each other. And we also designing the navigation form for our app. The next step was to briefing each screen and defining more details to our MVP, especially in terms of front end and our roots. And moving on to daily, uh, using the Trello to share our, our tasks, align status, uh, and have a place where we could have a real time overview and keep tracking of what everyone is working on. Yeah, regarding our technologies, we use Python, Flask in the backend, uh, Postgres for our SQL database. Uh, we also use uh, continuous integration uh, on GitHub. Uh, for as for the front end, we use React, and for our CSS, we use React Bootstrap um, because it enables us uh, to maintain a good, consistent design across our application, and it's also easy to customize. Uh, we also use a library called um, Socket.io. It's a JavaScript library to build our real chat live. Yeah, hi everybody. I'm going to uh, walk us through a bit of a demo here. It's going to move quite quickly. But um, first thing you can see is we have a full authentication that we've kind of built in. Um, and uh, you can create a user, if you can see it. But it's creating a user called Go. And there's a password confirmation, there's kind of bits and pieces. 
then when you sign up, you're able to log in, as you might expect. And then the first screen that you'll see there will be a feed page, uh, which is full of uh, help requests, as we call them, which is somebody saying basically, hey, I need some help uh, watering my plants. Can you please help me? Uh, to create those, you can come through to this kind of management area, which you'll see a little bit more later as well. And we can ask for some help. And um, so putting a message there, saying the dates which you need some help for, and also setting the price. So I'm willing to accept some help for £100 in this case. Uh, you can see that then showing up on the page. Um, another thing you can do is you can go and review other people's help requests and you can make an offer. So you might have to uh, borrow my doggy type thing but you, without calling it. Uh, so you can go in here and say, I'm willing to help you for 50 quid. Uh, or another one here as well. You can go in and, and uh, read help. Now, after this, we're going to go through to a page where you can <clears throat> excuse me, manage your offers. So in that area, you can see all the help requests that you've made. Um, but the offers that you've made as well, you're able to kind of accept and reject those. So here you can see those two that we've just made. Uh, and if I wanted to rescind one of those offers, let's say I'm no longer available, I can do it like that. Now, uh, another thing you can do is you can add plants to your profile. So this will be automatically added to those, those uh, help requests. So you can see what you need to help with planting. So there we've added a, an African sheep bush um, and some bamboo plants as well, a few of them. Uh, and then if we go through to the profile page next, you'll see the, a lot of information is there. So the plants that we've just added, uh, we've got things like the help request that we added at the beginning, uh, and also some user information that we've got. Uh, in there, you're able to update that. Um, so you can see here, we're just going to put a capital letter on the John, and we're going to save the changes there. Now, one of the cool things about uh, using Firefox for this is they have uh, different containers, which essentially allow you to have um, multiple login sessions running together. So we're going to log in as another user here, user here called TJ, um, who just happens to have some uh, outstanding kind of help requests and people that have submitted offers to them. So we're now going in to manage those um, where TJ is able to go in and accept some, able to reject others. Um, and then ultimately, when they've uh, accepted one and they want to start a chat with, in this case, Jane95, they can click a chat button and come through to this kind of socket driven real-time chat I'm going to send up a message like that, uh, and then in a moment we're going to log in in, in another container as J95, and we'll just be able to demonstrate quickly that we get this real-time kind of uh, in, uh, back and forth between these two guys. So uh, if I get the password right, then we can log in. Uh, we can respond to that message by going to the chat area. So here, if we go into the right chat first, sorry, and then you can see that that message is there. We can respond. And then if I go back to the tab in a second, you'll see that there's a message there ready to, to be seen by TJ. So that's a kind of the MVP that we developed. Uh, the last thing we see here is that you can log out. Uh, and then I'm going to hand over to Asia, who's going to talk about some of the challenges we had and the things that we might do in the future. There we go, we've logged out. Um, so in terms of challenges, we don't we didn't face many when it comes to teamwork, but we did have some technical issues. One of them being cause. Cause is an error that we received because we had two different domains. Um, so it's an error that you get when you're making a HTTP request to a different domain. So our backend was in Python Flask, our front end was in JavaScript React. Um, another thing that we faced was continuous integration issues. Um, it really did improve the integrity of our code base, but it did come with challenges as it wasn't picking up containers, although all the tests were passing. Overall, we are quite proud to say that we have over 400 commits throughout the last two weeks. We did great teamwork and used Agile methodology. And down below, you can see some of the features that we hope to implement moving forward in the future as well. Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate you listening and we are happy to take on any questions. Thank you very much, Tim Loom. Thank you for the presentation and very well done for your application as well. It's interesting too that you went for like live chats. Um, that's quite a tricky feature to implement. So nicely done on kind of like discovering how to do that on your own as well, because we never covered that in a course. Um, do we have any questions either from the room or um, through the Q&A? We'll give a bit of time for people to be able to ask their questions in the Q&A. Claire, we have one question in the room. Hi, uh, my question is, um, what service do you use to deploy the backend and uh, was it free?
Uh, yeah, I can I can answer this one. So uh, there may be a miscommunication there, but the, the back end isn't deployed. It's uh, yes. it's got continuous integration. So there's uh, obviously automated testing as it gets uploaded to GitHub. I think one of the first things that we want to do after this week is to look into uh, deploying it. And it's going to be an interesting challenge, really, because we do have this kind of microservices architecture where we have a separate back end to a front end. So we're going to have to find a way to get them to talk properly uh, whilst both being deployed independently. It does mean that we're able to then build things like a separate front end for mobile stuff using Swift on top of that and speak to the same backend. So cool challenges there. Um, I can see in the Q&A box, we've got a question. Um, so was playing with the WebSocket fun? I can't take that one. There was no fun. <laughs> <laughs> It took me a while to figure out how to to communicate the back end with the front end and how to join the two separate rooms. Like it took me a couple of days. We have one more question in the room. Uh, this is a bit of a general question, but uh, what was your favorite part of the um, the project and why? <laughs> <laughs> well, collective favorite part, I guess. <laughs> there. Um, I think as a team, we we enjoyed the um, yeah designing the back end and actually implementing the back end as well. Um, I think that was our big focus, uh, especially for the first half of the project. Um, and yeah, I think just generally that was, that was the best. Part. Yeah, um, we have got another question in the Q and A. Uh, was there a lot of emphasis on testing during development? Uh, yeah, there was a lot of emphasis specifically within our API. Um, so anytime we wanted to add any new features to it, we could do it safely without worrying about um, our tests failing. Essentially, we have continuous integration uh, implemented, so that also was able to pick up if there was any issues as well. Um, in terms of front end, uh, we hope to implement more tests, but because of time limit and having to produce something by the end of uh, the two weeks, we didn't implement as many tests as we'd hoped for in the front end, but that's something we're going to take on next week. Yeah, and just just to add on to that, um, for the back end specifically, I think we have sort of 90, 95% test coverage for all the code we have. So it was quite a big focus for us. We don't have any more questions in the room, Blair. Thanks, Team Bloom. Thank you very much. Uh, so our next team is going to be Team Recipes. -ish. Sorry, Claire, who was the next team? Oh, Team Recipes. Sorry. Sorry, that wasn't clear. Might work, right? Yeah. Messages. <laughs> ready I'm ready okay good evening everyone thank you for joining us uh tonight for the unveiling of something truly remarkable let's face it in today's fast-paced world time is a luxury many of us simply don't have so put your hands up if you relate to the frustration of scouring websites bombarded by pop-ups and lengthy blog posts just to find a simple recipe, right? So fear not, because Recipes is here to solve all your problems. Recipes effortlessly generates neatly organized recipes from websites for you to access anywhere, anytime. Thank you, Henry, for that great introduction. <laughs> well, this is Recipes the ultimate culinary companion. This UI is set up with, for setup and login is designed with simplicity and being hassle free. With just a few clicks, you're signed in. <laughs> <laughs> it was once a few clicks and you're signed in. <laughs> right. 
From there on out, we paste in our URL, which extracts the important information from said recipe. But it's not the end because you can customize it to your heart's content, including changing the title, the amount of servings, the amount of time, adding tags to help you. There is also, when we get to it, um, the ingredients can be customized to how your cooking style. And once that is done, it will be saved into your own collection. Yeah, so once the recipe is, is saved, you can like or unlike your favorite recipes. And you can also always refer to the original recipe page if you wish to do so. But you will have your recipe page have stored all your saved recipes so you won't need to search for them when you want to when you feel like making them you can go straight to your recipe page and here as well you can like your favorite ones and you will always have the options to generate your own recipe so if you don't want to use the recipe that's online you can use a recipe that you have at home or from a book you can fill in all the fields and then once that it's saved, that will also be available on your recipe page. So again, you can add in the title, the tags that you wish to have on that recipe, as well as all the ingredients you need and the methods. And as I mentioned, when it's saved, it's going to go onto your My Recipes so you can access that as well. Uh, cool. So I'm going to... Oh. Hello. Uh, I'm going to talk about our planning process. Um, so, yeah, we kind of based all our planning uh, on Figma, um, two different Figma files. We kind of started uh, initially on this Fig Jam here, um, generating quite a few ideas, and then we settled on uh, this one because we all find it very annoying um, trying to scour the internet for recipes. Uh, so we decided to keep our scope very small and just tackle this one problem and try and get that really polished. Um, so yeah, I think we did that quite well considering we're standing here not in tears and we actually got something together. Um, so yeah, then we kind of did our UI design uh, on Figma as well. You can see the the initial design and then kind of how it blossomed into what it is today. Um, and then yeah, I'm just going to talk about quickly the actual um, core functionality, the recipe scraping. Um, we kind of noticed that uh, all these recipe pages have to follow a certain format on, I think, so they can be visible on Google. Um, so we kind of decided to go uh, use that and extract that data um, and bring that into the site, uh, into, a, into a lovely uh, UI. Yeah. Yeah, so in terms of how we work together as a team, I think in particular we did a really good job of sharing knowledge with each other, and we did that by writing comments in, in our code under the bits that we'd written, sort of explain it to each other. We also did um, some feedback in each other's pull requests um, to sort of share ideas and things. Um, I think one, one area we could have improved on was... Um, was making smaller commits, making smaller merges more frequently, um, just because we we came into uh, a lot of conflicts at times when uh, when we were trying to merge big commits. Um, yeah, and then overall, in terms of uh, of, of makers as a whole, um, I think we found that yeah, teamwork was really important. Like the, the technical side was important, but I think even more than that, it was. Um, how we work together as a team. So um, again, in this project, it was it was no different. Um, I think that's I think that's it. Yeah, we can take any questions. Thank you very much. Yeah. So no, thank you very much, guys, and it's an amazing presentation as well. Just today, I was looking for a recipe, and I think it's gone from the internet now. So if I had recipes, this wouldn't have been a problem because I could have seen this. <laughs> so I think you know it's a very very useful tool, and uh, the user experience as well throughout is really seamless and smooth. So really well done for this because uh, it's a lot of work that you don't see. Um, it just feels great to use the page. So nicely done. Any questions uh, either in the um, Q and A from the from the oh, sorry from people online or in the room?
We have a question in the room. Hi, uh, great job, first of all, love the idea. Um, I was wondering how, um, based on the code you've written in the backend, um, how easy would it be to, to adapt it for recipe that are not in English? Ooh. Um, yeah, no. I, th I think to be fair, because, well, someone correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I'm, I think this JSON LD format that we're uh, taking from, from each site is a pretty standardized thing across, across Google. So I'd assume the actual fields will be in English, but then the content in can be, is that, is that what you meant though? I, I don't know if they would be in English on the, like, we haven't checked to be honest, but I would imagine the format would be, would be similar. And then you would just have to switch the word, let's say, because we scraped at a, at type recipe. And I imagine if you switch the word recipe in English for the word recipe in another language, I imagine they always follow some format. So it would be more translating the words we're looking for, let's say. Yeah, that explains. But yeah, so you can still extract the data, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, also, I have another question. Uh, how how much pair programming did, did you do throughout the? Um, yeah, we. I think initially we started pairing quite a lot, and then it was kind of very tar like dependent on the tasks that we kind of had. Um, some some of the trickier tasks, like the the actual scraping. Yeah, we, we definitely paired on, um, and I think that was very beneficial because it's it's not nice to suffer in silence. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, we, we we did utilize that and found it a really useful tool, actually. Um, obviously, just time pressure kind of uh, throws things up in the air sometimes, but yeah. Yes. Any more questions in the room? None from the room. Any from the Q and A, Claire? No, there doesn't seem to be. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. And thank now you. we'll open the floor to Team The Daily Grind. <laughs> keep, 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 keep. Uh, just while I'm setting up, uh, just a quick introduction to my group. It's Kay Rose on my right, James Lee on my left. Hello, 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 hello. You get uh, Andre, and I just want to point out that this isn't our whole group. Uh, some of our group couldn't make it today. Uh, I believe Naeem is in the chat. I just want to get that out of the way. Our group is called The Daily Grind. And with that, I'll leave you away. Hello, good evening. As Andre said, I'm James Lee. Happy Friday. So, um, with The Daily Grind, if you press the next slide, essentially, what is The Daily Grind? It's a selection of mini games where a user can build up points in an area of life of their choosing. More of an active person or use strength? Or are you more of an intellect? You can choose an intellect theme mini game. But if you're more of a thinker, so the basic aim of the game is to level up, and you want to be at the highest level once the end of the game completes. So that is the main premise of the daily grind. Andre, next slide, please. So just so that I can see, I want to direct your attention to the right hand of the screen. Essentially, the main premise of each mini game is to build up stats, collecting money, or stats to reach an end goal. On the right hand side, you can see some of the tech stack and frameworks we discussed, um, JS, React, Ruby, PHP, Vue. But ultimately, the circle in the red is Python and Pygame, and that's what we initially ended up with. And um, I'll hand it over to Andre, who will explain in a bit more detail about our planning process via Figma. So, so I use this one. So from our initial plan, we needed to gather what we wanted the actual project to look like. So we went to Figma and just started to brainstorm what pages we need, what screens would look like, and what mini games we would have. And in the end, what 
that would look like once you've completed the mini game. So as you can see in the middle of the homepage, uh, either side of that are the mini games and then beyond that are the war screens that that was just our initial uh, MVP that we had in the top right in the very little piece you can see is part of our schema, which is just the database. So we can, we wanted to know what information we was controlling and how that was going to relate to each other to help us decide what kind of uh, database we wanted to use. Following that, that was everything you've seen so far happened on Monday, the first Monday. Following that, we want to really try and figure out how we was going to implement this with the code we was using. So the next day, we made tickets based off our Figma and basically just said, we don't know what how to use Pygame. Let's find something, pick a, pick a specific task and just work towards implementing it. And that's what we did. So with that, I will pass you on to Katie Rose. So we, we wanted to implement a lot of different technologies um, and we used them all for different reasons. So we discussed we wanted to use Pygame. We were building it a, a couple of different mini games. So we thought this would be the most suitable. We wanted to, um, because we were looking at user points, stats, et cetera, we needed a relational database. So we went ahead with Postgres, PostgreSQL. Um, and we'd worked before with Flask in the back end and using Python, but we also want to challenge ourselves and um, bring in React to interact with Flask as well. Lastly, I forgot to mention actually, the Pygame GUI was a real essential part of how our whole game looks essentially. Um, and then yeah, onto our problem solving. So I think everyone can sort of relate to the, to, to the cycle <laughs> when you have that initial problem and it needs to be solved. So going in from the get go, we, none of us really knew how to use Pygame, it was completely new. Um, so we spent the first day or so just completely learning everything that we could and this meant extensive research we knew how to read the documentation a bit more effectively now um especially with pygame it was there was so much available on the internet which was great um and then i think knowledge sharing was quite useful as well because i think the structure of how how we're building stuff in the beginning really solidified how we'd build the rest of the game so with that as well um flagging our issues as soon as possible. So um, any issues we were facing on throughout the, um, the actual building of the, the games, we found that if we flag it earlier, obviously more eyes on it, more likely we are to solve the problem earlier. And that links in again with pair programming. Anything that was a bit harder to solve was solved more quickly by pair programming. And I think, we're now on to the demonstration. Okay, I'm going to play a few videos just to demonstrate how the game actually works. So when a user starts, they are able to log in to create a user. And what this will do is create their, create their, create a space for their stats. So we'll keep track of their stats, the games they've played. Uh, if I just <laughs> through this so they can make a user account and then log in and once they've logged in they will come to this page their home page all right on the left you can see the stats on the right you can see the history and at the top you just get a little greeting the bottom left and bottom right buttons are buttons to the mini games and i will quickly go through each one now so we wanted to try and work with different parts of Pygame, not just do one specific task. We wanted uh, something that was clickable, clickable events. We wanted something that had key presses. The running game uses a uh, key input spacebar just to jump over hurdles. As you can see, and once a game is over, there will actually be a react uh pop-up so this is a web pop-up whereas the game itself is just a pi game window 
next mini game I'll take you to is the woodcutting game. Unlike the running game, which was uh, a key-based inputs, these are click-based inputs. So as you can see, the icon appears, they click on the tree that they need to cut down and each, uh, each tree that's cut down is a point. And once again, Ward's screen showing the points that are earned, the experience and the money that a user earns. On the other side, we have the intellect-based mini games, which are more uh, your, your thinking challenges. So you might recognize this from other little games as a kid, just a simple pairing, uh, pairing images. And again, we wanted to make sure that we tried different things when it came to Pi game, which is why there's no real correlation between the games. It's just we ourselves wanted to challenge what we could do with uh, Pi game. And the last one, most people should recognize something like this. Just a little pub quiz, pop quiz. Now, we don't need to talk about how many times I had to record this video. <laughs> because some of the times might have looked a little bad, just sort of, uh, maybe just a few wrong answers, but it's fine, it's fine. See, I'm getting all these right, it's not a problem. <laughs> and the last one is just when a user completes these challenges, their stats are leveled up. So if you can look on the right, um, on the left side, uh, you can see the user's stats. Oops. So once they complete mini games, their stats will be leveled up. And as you can see, this user has leveled up in their strength stats and that's correlated to their overall stats as well. Um, I would like to say that the way we designed this as well, it's very scalable. So each mini game basically works independently. So if we wanted to, we can make more mini games and just add that by adding it to the main stack of the app. Uh, and it wouldn't have much effect on the overall code. Um, yeah, using the screen renders. So uh, each one of our members made a class, which is the screen, and that screen just holds all the information for each mini game. And that that information is passed as a parent to each mini game and that's how we were able to make it more scalable and easy to transfer between screens and yeah that's it almost any questions who's the high scorer in your team <laughs> you know you would be yeah <laughs> chance to play it. I had to, I had to do a lot of play testing, so it probably would be. <laughs> yeah, I've definitely got the highest level. Questions? Did you guys come up with all the ideas for each mini game on the first day, or you came up with new games along the week? Yes, for the most part, the only one we didn't have was the memory game. That was like, we came up with that idea on Monday or Tuesday. But yeah, all of those games were on our MVP. We was going to do two quizzes, but Katie really wanted to mix up a little bit. So she decided to make a memory game, which turned out really well. And she worked on really fast. Um, I've got one. Uh, did you guys do any testing for Pi game? And <laughs> slash, yeah, it's we we don't need to talk about testing uh yeah the testing the testing will happen one day maybe this year maybe 2026 so then what does the money do so originally this was supposed to be the reason why it's also called the daily grind is because it was supposed to be like a almost like a life sim so each mini game was going to be like a job rather than just like a mini game and what that was, was you do mini games, you make money, and then you could use the money to like buy items, buy houses, make a family, stuff like that. But to just to 
fit, make it scalable and to fit in the time, we stuck to just having a mini game and then the money's just there for if we wanted to work on it more in the future. <laughs> I was just wondering about like the graphics of it. Like, did you get the images from somewhere or is yeah, it mainly? Yeah, we went to game? free sources. The, for the woodcutting game, I went to just a free source website and just asked for trees or woods uh, for the background. And then this is the same thing for the uh, axe icon. And it's also the same for the running game. The images were just free source images. Question. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, no, the last question uh, was one of mine. Um, another question I have is Do you guys want to go into game development after going through this process? <laughs> <laughs> um, I can give my opinion on that because I was, I did a course on, um, on game development and I really did want to jump into games development, but after a while, as it's not really the best industry to jump into uh, at the moment. And after some time, it's just, yeah, I'd rather just enjoy coding for apps, web apps, uh, mobile apps. That means so it's quite, it's quite a good way just to develop skills and the points. We've done the graph beginning, you know, bringing them all back together. Like, okay, we'll do very useful. <laughs> Claire, I think we're good in the room if you want to jump to the Q&A one. So we've got a few questions in the Q&A as well. So... Uh, the first one is, how did the point system work in the running game? Uh, each each tree that's cut down. So to cut down a tree, you have to click on it five times. And then after that, that's, that counts as a tree cut down. What I couldn't show was that there is noise inputs on the click and um, feedback on the clicks. So you can tell if you're actually hitting the tree. And each tree cut down is a point. Cool, thank you. And then we've got some more questions. Uh, so this comment slash question is from uh, Peter. I like this way of learning something, just pick up a task and work out how to solve it with Pygame, then rinse and repeat. So how did you find that? Were there any downsides? So for example, realizing that you'd done some, you'd done an early ticket very differently once you knew more? Um... Well, I think I can answer that. Um, when I was doing a bit of the... Um the running game in the first iteration there was an example where it would just display the, the track and field game and timeout after a certain while but when i mentioned this to the group i did it as functional programming but naim really came up with an interesting idea which we use um as a template moving forward was child and parent classes so one base class would inherit from the child class so inherit all the attributes um, from one game to another and so yeah that's something that i definitely learned moving forward um, I'm not too sure if anyone has so anything to add to that. Question again? <laughs> I forgot the question as well. <laughs> I think if, if you would have done something differently once you, uh, so with a bit of experience, like let's say in week two or so, would you have done something differently than on week one, for example? Um, I don't think so because it, Tuesday was really the day where we went out and was like, we need to really learn how to use this code because it was it was very a little bit concerning because we we finished planning and came to the conclusion that's like, well, where do we start? And so going out individually and learning for ourselves what we need to do, and then at the end of the day we came together and just kind of pulled our knowledge a little bit. That really helped just speed up the process, I guess. And then beyond that we were able to if someone was stuck we were able to just assist each other with certain little details that someone might have done that other people hadn't worked on before yeah. oh sorry no, i was just gonna say i think pie game was fun as well so i'm glad we used that 
And we've got a couple more. So we've got a question from Gabriel. Did you measure how much CPU and memory the game is consuming and what tools did you use to measure and how was that process? Um, we didn't use any tools to measure, I couldn't even say. But when it comes to Pi game itself, it's not a very demanding uh, demanding bit of code. It's, it's entirely script and the most demanding things we did would have been the request to the React um, website. Everything else would have, it wouldn't have been asking for much. And we've got an anonymous question. So what devices can the game be played on? It's purely a... Yeah, like on your computer, essentially. Yeah, on your computer. We wanted to adapt it to be uh, playable on the web, but it was getting to a point where we just didn't have time to implement that. <laughs> so that's why we opted for the React pop-up screen, because we did want to try and have some web integration. Yeah, so we were looking at using PyBag before, which would be um, where it be all a web applications who'd be able to access it um, somewhere else. <laughs> but yeah, we just didn't have time. So maybe that's something we can look into. Okay, thank you. And one last question. So from Lasselle, is there some kind of notification or motivational warning to keep on the, the daily grind? <laughs> um, what's the question sorry if the there was to continue if, the, if there was notification if there's any notifications to like keep you motivated to keep playing I think not the moment good idea, yeah, yeah no it is a good idea we like for example when you level up there's not not really anything that happens I would have liked to implement like a oh you leveled up kind of notification stuff like that but that would all come with if we was able to add the features of uh, a user can come and play a little bit and then make their money and buy their stuff that would really be the part where users would be like I kind of want to build up my user a little bit get some money get a house yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> well one of the other things as well that we wanted to do was have um you could play other friends online kind of thing so, yeah you can sort of compete against them as well that's a future goal Sandra said the beauty of it is that scalable only so any implementations that we want to do can be done any so uh, watch this space as they say <laughs> cool thank you very much guys maybe this is the beginning of a new new um game development company <laughs> <laughs> Um, cool, very cool. So thank you very much. So this thank you. presentations that you've seen so far are all from the software development specialism. Uh, but we do offer more than one uh, specialism at Makers. And one of the other um, kind of pathways that developers can choose is cloud deployment. And I think we've got one more presentation coming from someone who did the cloud deployment uh, pathway for the project HOSP Blue. Um, would you like to come forward? Thanks, Claire. I'm just going to share my screen. Is that, Is that working? working? No, I'm not sure your screen is shared currently. There we go. There it is. Okay. Um, firstly, contrary to popular belief, I'm not Matthew Gentle Shepherd. Um, this is a good name. My name is Harry. Um, and although I am presenting by myself, this was very much a team effort. So I had teammates George, Joe, Troy, and Sean, who sadly couldn't be here tonight because they're located across the UK and didn't feel like traveling to central London on short notice, and also appendicitis. Um, but he's fine. So it is fine. Um, that's okay. I'll be presenting solo, and it's going to be fun. So this is just a, this is just a small overview of the challenges we faced. We were given access to a vet hospital server, and we were told there's something wrong with it. You need to fix it. Don't have any access to the code. Um, have at it. There were no instructions. It was just like all just wit and will. 
of what we'd everything we'd done come together. Um, so we only had basic documentation. Our job was to work within those type constraints and utilize what we were given. So we started by reading the documentation and adjusted our load balancer, which I'll explain a bit more on later. We then built on that by adding layers of security and implementing features around it to improve both the success rates and of requests and robustness of the system without causing any downtime. So the way we were graded um, was traffic was ramped up and down, and based on the amount of success of the success, the rate of requests that made it through. Um, we were closer to 100, and essentially we wanted to aim for 99% or higher. I think there's a, something in the workplace called five nines, which is 99.999%, and that's what everyone should aim for um, if they get into DevOps. So between the load balancer and the hospital web server was where uh, most of our work was based. The gravity of the situation was we had little to work with, but we needed to allow ourselves breathing space and give ourselves a foundation to build upon. So our main objectives, maintain, enhance, and address. We wanted to maintain functionality, enhance observability to understand and monitor the performance better, and address security vulnerabilities without disrupting current operations. That's another thing. We had to fix the server without taking it down. Um, our solutions. These were kind of our aims as well as our solutions. It was kind of like, don't give up. When it doesn't work, try again. If that still doesn't work, try again again. Um, and when it does work, do it faster. I think that's applicable to everyone, hopefully. So, um, so we used Amazon S3 buckets, which are essentially virtual filing cabinets, and we use it to store and organize and retrieve our data. Each bucket can hold an unlimited amount of data or files known as objects. And these buckets are they're like a reliable solution, which to store and manage extensive log files by which you can track your performance, uh, the live performance and security of your application. And the logs of themselves, they can be like 500 lines to infinite, whatever it gives out. Um, so you need it organized because it's a pain to go through each line incrementally and work out what's next. Okay, um, so here's Harry's little passing application. That's been suddenly renamed. It was really Troy's little passing application. Um, and for those who don't know, parsing is essentially incrementally analyzing your data. So first, as I just showed you, the logs were downloaded from the cloud, um, and we sifted through them to extract and organize information like errors. And these parse logs were reviewed and so we could understand the issues. And streamlining the process monitors and maintains the health and security of our cloud-based system by making the logs more accessible and easier to analyze. And this method essentially is how you find out what your errors are. So again, to find out what our errors are, we started with a Band-Aid approach, which is kind of like you start by um, addressing the symptom and then you work your way to the cause. So you don't fix it immediately, but you kind of like whack a mole and while you debug where it comes from. Um, this can be quickly applied and monitored. We made an image on the server and when we made sure it worked, we, ut we utilized a retry function, um, which keeps in mind with our philosophy of do it again and again and again and again. Um, and this kept our success rate above 99% for the most part. There was one day when traffic was too much for us, but we got back up there because we tried again. Um, and then we stored the results in a database. So we used Lambda, which is a function on AWS, which is Amazon Web Services and it automatically runs your code without needing to manage servers. And it monitored, we monitored it using an application on AWS called CloudWatch. This is like a health check system for your cloud application, and it keeps an eye on the function like a security camera. Um, the live tailing feature was kind of like watching live footage and just lets you see in real time the errors that happen. So like if you're watching a broadcast of a sports game and you can see every play as it unfolds. Um, it's crucial for spotting and fixing problems because I know there are some cloud jobs where you need to be on call at all time. And this is like the quickest way to find out what's happening, what's going wrong and where to fix it. Initially, all our traffic was operated over HTTP, but we shifted to HTTPS to secure it. S stands for secure. Um, I just made that up. I don't know if it's true, but like, that's how I remember it. Okay. Someone can let me know about that. Um, alongside, we implemented caching, 
which let us um, provide speedy responses. As we, promote, as we approach stability, we moved the service to a more cost-effective infrastructure and monitored the impact of our improvements. Don't know if anyone's played around, well, I know some of you have with AWS, but it can be really easy to let the cost get away from you and find yourself with a high bill easily. So this is like one of the most, as like cloud dev or DevOps, it's like important to keep the cost down for the client of who's paying you to do it. Um, our, in our live system, we implemented securing our, our connection so that people could only create items as themselves and caching responses. And in our development section, we had added interaction logs and the ability to store it from the screening. Just what is a load balancer? Well, funny you ask. A load balancer is configured to handle incoming web traffic. It's kind of, I like to think of it as um, an executive assistant who, if you're getting loads of phone calls, and they can forward the phone calls to whoever it needs to get to so that no one person who would be getting the phone calls is overwhelmed. So it balances all the traffic throughout like that. Um, we had five rules to determine how to direct the traffic. That's the second column. Um, there are four distinct target groups, each consisting of resources like server instances or our respective targets, and they were designated to receive traffic on that assigned port. Um, yeah. So here is our overview of our work over the two weeks. This is basically a map of what we did on Amazon Web Services. It looks quite complicated, and it feels quite complicated, and it is quite complicated. <laughs> but again, what I like to do is just compare it to something else. So imagine, if you close your eyes, imagine you're at a busy train station, right? And there's trains coming in. So the controller is the DNS server, server and it decides which platform or load balancer each train should go to. The platforms are designed to handle both the regular trains, which is HTTP, or the really speedy bullet trains, which is HTTPS. Um, if a train can't park at the platform on its first try, we have a system called the retry fiction, which does it again and again and again. And that gives it a go without causing any delays. Meanwhile, so there's our retry function at the top in orange. And then we have our, um, our database, which is there in blue, RDS database, store data. And that keeps records of all the trains that are coming and going. Um, we use that in tandem with CloudWatch in the bottom right. And that watches the board to make notes to ensure everything runs on time. And this way you can keep track on everything and make sure all the passengers or users um, have the smooth and secure journey. And that's where it ends up, the hospital control web server. Teamwork. Um, so we split into groups to save time and multitask. There were a few things that we we got into groups and we tried two different ways to solve the same problem so that if one of them broke, as it often does the first time, we would have a backup that could we could go to instead of wasting all our time on one. Um, we used Trello to keep on top of things and help with communication. Um, we had some difficulty in estimating tasks. Sometimes it can be difficult to accurately estimate the time and difficulty of certain tasks. Again, we, other than basic documentation, we had no instruction. Um, so you don't know if you're following a false lead or not. Um, but we fixed that with, we did mini retros and we supported each other and became super friends. <laughs> what we'll do differently. So. Our coach was essentially the, it's kind of like Dungeons and Dragons, and he was the dungeon master who took on the role as the HOSP team, uh, the server team that is. And to simulate the workplace, they were, the server team wasn't the most cooperative, which is to be expected in the workplace. Um, maybe we should have stood our ground more and been a bit more aggressive in that aspect while also respecting them. Um, we could have prepared a GitLab repo earlier to consolidate work. Um, Copy, replicated the backend to remove unreliable responses and added logging to make passing easier so we can find our errors faster. Um, here's our mini retro. I won't read out everyone's, um, but for mine, um, I found that last eight weeks quite difficult, but also very enjoyable. Feelings ranging from imposter syndrome to you, you can do anything because it's really satisfying when it works. Um, and learned a lot from my coach, my team, and myself. It's been a real blend of technical mastery, the power of teamwork, and the cycle of always learning and problem solving. I think anyone can learn to do anything. Um, it's the act of learning that is embracing the discomfort of learning, which is a huge part of immersive learning in general at Makers. Um, the act of learning is often more difficult than what you're learning in itself. Um, 
so I think knowing how to learn can like you can if it looks difficult you learn how to learn it and then you learn it and here you can see firstly you can hire me <laughs> I work for fun and for money um and here you can see our these are responses so in the part you can see here how many successes we had how many failures in overall so it's done by the past hour and in the past day so on this Friday they ran for traffic and went down to 86 percent which you would think is really good um but because it's below 99.999 percent it is not that's why it's in red um and then we had one failure recently but beyond that it was all good um thank you for listening um enjoy your weekend the end thank you very much um any questions oh i can see some in the q a but any questions in the room we have one in the room claire one second johnny why since so far away Really, really interesting. I'm wondering, when you're setting up the load balancer, do you have to define the rules yourself for how the load is balanced? Or is that something that kind of AWS takes care of for you? So if I remember correctly, I think it's either or. It depends what your specific task is doing, but you can set up certain rules or conditions that need to be met for where to distribute the load to. Um, but I'm pretty sure it has an automatic one, but that kind of, it just basically does it evenly. But it depend, depending on what the task is, you might want more traffic going to a certain place than another. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think that's the answer. It does as you need, when you need. But, yeah, you need to define it. Cool, thanks. Um, so we've got a question from the Q&A from Peter. Did you have any difficulties with retrying requests with the side effects? So, for example, to place an order on an e-commerce site? Um, to be 100% honest, I'm not 100% sure. That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> we didn't try that, to be honest. It's, do you know what? It's probably very likely. So I'm going to give an unsure yes. Any other questions in the room? No, I think we're good, Claire. We a question in the Q&A that just popped in. Uh, from Anna. So do you know what specifically caused the issue on the Friday after days of working and what did you uh, change after that day? So what what changed in the back end was our coach decided it'd be a good time to ramp up the traffic. So um, yeah, he ramped up to 17,732. I know that's only the successful ones. There's another nearly 3k on top of that. And I think at that point in time, that was the most that we had. Um, so we just extended our load because you can have multiple load balances. Um, and yeah, that was what we did. That, that was a shock though, because we didn't have much warning. And at that, at that point in time, I don't think my group knew that you could have there were multiple ways to manage it. It was just like, this is the one way. And if that breaks, that's it. Um, yeah, but luckily we didn't have that many failures afterwards. I think that approach worked looking at our failures. Yeah. Thank you. And I don't know if you can see the Q&A box, I'm just going to say. So we've got another comment from Peter saying that uh, it, it's very impressive work, everyone. Amazing what teams have achieved. Um, a sentiment which I wholeheartedly agree with. Claire, I'm going to add one more final comment, which is I cannot believe that you can all do this in two weeks. I can barely respond to an email in two weeks. So that's incredible work. Claire, I think we don't have any more questions here. Do you want to wrap us up? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, but yeah, so I think, I think I'd like to wrap up by saying thank you to all the teams today. And I think I've said that a few times today and like in the past few weeks as well, but I think it's really important to take stock of just how much progress you've all made in just about four months. I think it's really brilliant and it just really is a lot of credit to yourselves and to all the work that you put in that you're able to build such complete applications uh, and have such a great understanding of like AWS, in your case, Harry, in just so little time. Uh, and I hope that like in, with makers as well, I have to say we kept throwing challenges in your way, like week after week, things kept changing. The pace of the course was really fast. Um, so I hope that now you feel really confident that you can learn anything and build anything as well after your experience here at makers. And I have to say on the personal note, it's been really lovely working with you. And I'm really excited to see what you're going to be doing next. I really hope that uh, once you uh, move on to your first world, you find it rewarding and challenging and that you enjoy your next few steps in the world of software engineering. Thank you very much, guys. 
Thank you, Claire. And thank you to everyone at home. Au revoir, Claire. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Let me know if uh, I need for anything else, but uh, see you guys.